here on this end. Sure, we'll bring it up on that end. Okay. Here you go. And it will say it's live, so. So you can go ahead and keep it on, and if we have any issues, then I can access access it from there. So I've got till 49 mm -hmm. less, you know, which your iPad has. Can't get it? Yeah. Sometimes mine takes watching the clock up there. Yeah, it's the same. That's like an atomic clock. No pressure, Gary. You just have to get it logged in in less than 30 seconds. <clears throat> Here, you want this? Nope. Okay. No, it's a small screen. <laughs> I couldn't see it if it was that small. That might be trouble. Good evening and welcome to the Defiant City School Board of Education meeting. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Cheryl, would you uh, do the roll call for us, please? We have Kathy Davis that will be uh, attending by phone. So. Mrs. Davis? Here. Mr. Motes? Here. Mrs. Oberlin? Here. Mr. Rodenberger? Here. Mr. Wall? Here. At this time, we will uh, waive the public presentation because of uh, COVID rules. We are doing things online. If you have a question, feel free to answer. Also. And as a point of clarification, because Ms. Davis is calling in remotely and because of House Bill 404 does permit her to participate remotely as a full member, including voting rights during that process, I cleared that up with our legal counsel today. Mm -hmm. uh, move on down to the uh, Treasurer's Report 4.1 discussion item. Or, uh, you guys have the um, financials for the month of December. Um, I put the current five-year forecast summary out there as well, but there hasn't been a change to it. I haven't updated the numbers because we were waiting on um, to see what the numbers would be in January. Um, and today we did get notified that um, the reductions that were made in fiscal year 21 are going to be reduced. So we're still getting a reduction, but it's not going to be as big as what we what we were originally told, which was like 300 some thousand. Um, they sent out an email with the link to the numbers, mm -hmm. and I haven't been able to get on. I asked uh, the, Mr. Morton, and he couldn't get on either. The link was like it wouldn't load for us, probably because every school personnel in the, in the country or in the state was trying to hit it at the same time. I mean, so that, that's good news. That'll help um, offset the deficit spending. Um, we're still at about a half a million for deficit spending, so that'll definitely help toward that. Um, I'm assuming it'll probably be around 100,000. They were saying about one third, but uh, I don't know that for sure. And they said you should realize that in your first foundation payment in, in February. February. Yep. Correct. Okay. So we'll start getting that back a little bit. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, they also came out in with the second round of ESSER funds. Um, we did receive ESSER funds in the very beginning of the year. If you remember, it was like four hundred twenty-three thousand um, dollars. Twenty and change went to the non-publics. Um, for equi our equitable services and the rest stayed with us. We used it to offset um, salaries um, for people whose positions may have been eliminated had we had the loss of funding. Um, this second round of ESSER funding is $1.6 million estimated coming to Defiant City School. So it's three times what we got last time. So we're hoping, we don't, those aren't the final numbers, but they're the numbers that were released today. So we're hoping we'll get um, that and be able to use that to offset some of the other expenses we've had to incur with um, you know, the pandemic and so on and so forth. So, so it was a good day for finance. We are going to get less taken away and we're getting more money with um, the ESSER funds. So sure, will that money have to be spent physical year 21? Um, I don't know, but I, I don't think so. Last time the ESSER funds were allowed to be used for two years. Um, 
So I, I doubt they would have that restriction given it to us this late in the year, um, especially that amount of money. And there's likely to be specific things that it can be spent on. Right. There's going to be guidelines, right. and so. we're going to you know we're going to try to offset as much as much expense as we can out of the general fund. Um, that has been increased because of the pandemic and because of related services because of the pandemic. We're seeing a lot of students um, in our preschool that are doing itinerant services instead of coming in for services. Right. So that has increased our our billing there quite a bit. So you know maybe we'll be able to offset some of those expenses. What about uh, say athletics for not being able to collect any revenue for athletic revenue? Do you think that could be used for that? Or is that um, stretching it? Athletics can't. You can't use. Um, my understanding is with the pre previous ESSER funds, we couldn't use it for athletics. Right. We could use it for um, students, um, but we can't specifically, you know, offset off the cost of athletics. So. What does that stand for? Do you know offhand? Okay. Um, I knew somebody was going to ask me. I remember. Six. Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. Uh -huh. Thank it's you. part of the coronavirus response and relief supplemental appropriation. It's it's part of the CARES Act. It's just okay. phase two of the CARES Act. Okay. That's the simplest way I interpret it. And yeah, it, this was like the first round of money that came out when mm -hmm. the CARES money started getting allocated. This was the first round. And then we got money specifically for like technology and broadband and so on and so forth. But oh. this was that first big amount of money that we used for PPE, mostly for PPE and for digital academy and offset salaries. Mm -hmm. so. our, our kindergarten through second grade Chromebooks, we had out earmarked some of the money from that we got for that. The out of first of round. The, the second round. Second or round. The second, not this round, but of a, a different grant. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I mean, all the money that we have been given so far, um, ESSER funds are allocated or spent, um, CARES money that we got um, for the um, computer technology, that's all been spent with the K2 upgrade. Um, the only thing we really have left that hasn't been spent fully is broadband connectivity grant. Um, and we're working to um, use the hotspots that we got to be able to offset that expense. Um, so technically for us, without this money, we would have been done with the CARES money. Um, it was all spent or allocated to salary. So, so it's, this is a nice package because I don't know if you remember when I presented the five-year forecast, all of those salaries coming back to the general fund in 2022 because this, the ESSER funds were gone. Mm -hmm. So this will you know, maybe give us another year of that, so. Sounds great. Thank you. Um, so those are the financials. Um, the only other thing I have is when we did the, appro the amended appropriations last board meeting in January, um, since then, it was like literally the next day, um, we got an allocation increase for our 499 fund of 547377. So I just put down there that I'd like to include that in the last appropriation, amended appropriations, and submit one for the end of January. Um, so I'd like the approval to go ahead and do that, and add that to the appropriate the amended appropriations. Alright, so now we'll move on to the action items. Um, <laughs> 4.1. I'll move to approve the uh, December 2020 financials as presented in nine I'll second. Here is a second. I have a roll call, please. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mr. Motes? Yes. Mrs. Oberlin? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Rodenberger? Yes. Mr. Wall? Yes. Uh, moving on down to 4.2, the um, appropriation modification. I have a motion to approve that. I'll move on 4.2. Chris? I'll second. Gary with a second. All those, uh, roll call. Nice. <laughs> Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mr. Wall? Yes. Mr. Rodenberger? Yes. Mrs. Oberlin? Yes. Mr. Moe? Yes. Thank you. Moving on down to the uh, uh, superintendent discussion items. Well, well, the first thing I want to do is uh, make sure Mr. McDonough is very aware in the seven or eight school boards that he covers that January is school board recognition month and uh, school board member recognition month at that. And um, the uh, school boards school boards, and members of school boards exemplify local citizen control and decision making. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank you publicly. Uh, you do spend a great deal of time. You take your job seriously. Um, 
you're reliable, you're dependable, um, you challenge us to be the best that we can be, and that's all part of the job, and there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, but you, you, you encompass the entire aspect of every child's education from their facilities to what books they can use and what have you, and uh, we appreciate that. And uh, I'm asking that our community, if they see one of you out and about being a community member as well, thank you for being a, a school board member. Uh, we've had to make some tough decisions, especially this year, and there are more coming in the years ahead. And, uh, you know, you take it seriously, and I appreciate that. that so thank you. And I know Cheryl, I'll speak for Cheryl as well. So thank you, school board members. <laughs> it's you. not just for me, but it, it's from, from everybody that works here, and we appreciate all that you do. I do have some very nice jacketed certificates for you. Um, <laughs> and I say that, uh, and I believe I put them in correct order. Let's see you here. Wesley Motes, the Board of Education President. Sure. Mr. Mr. Wall, Vice President of Board of Education, thank you. Mrs. Oberlin, thank you. Member, thank you. And Mr. Rodenberger, member. And I do want to recognize Mrs. Oberlin. The uh, Ohio School Boards Association did send us a nice plaque, Tim, uh, for uh, Mrs. Oberlin. This is her 25th year of service as a Board of Education member. This will be a Excellent uh, photo opportunity for the Crescent News and Mrs. Oberlin receiving her yeah. uh, 25 year plaque. Oh, so. Well, thank you. That's All very right. nice. Yes. Thank you. Right. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Make sure you guys are six feet apart, Hannah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good. Well, thank yeah. you very much. That's, that was very nice of them to yeah. recognize that and send that, so thank I you. I think last year was 25. It says 2020 on it. Kathy, I have your certificate here as well, and uh, I'll virtually hand it to you. Congratulations, okay? Thank you, sir. All right. You're Congrats, welcome. Chris. Thank you. All right. Um, moving on, item 5-2 uh, defines virtual academy enrollment numbers. You have those. Uh, uh, enrollment numbers attached to you, and uh, you'll see that basically the net difference is 242 students came back to school from our initial um, August 24 enrollment of 487, and uh, what our d January 21, I'm sorry, January 22 numbers were. I ran those numbers so that you would have them um, at you know the the Friday uh, last Friday, so we'd have it. So 242 students have come back. I've actually had uh, in the, so today's Monday already, I, I had to get it. Uh, since that, uh, I've had uh, two kindergartners and a second grader uh, request to come back. And again, I reach out to the principal. The principal is then uh, really makes the final determination and it's based upon um, you know, class sizes, et cetera. So um, we, you can see it broken down by grade. So, um, I know when Mrs. Swisher sees those, sees those numbers, she's excited because uh, that, that's an, an expense that's uh, a daunting expense in, in having the virtual academy. So we went from a high of 487, that was the first enrollment, to where we are right now. Okay? About half return. About half return, correct. Oh. Question, do we have any that came from this year or last year? That's a great back? question, yes. There were 17 students that elected to leave and go to the virtual academy, and that's still our net effect. Gotcha. Okay? That's a very good question. Did you, was there any kind of surveys with anybody about why people switched from? Why they wanted to come back? Either way, I mean. Um, the, the ones that wanted to, to leave, I think of those, 11 of them were high school students, um, and uh, I think, their rationale, you know, we, we didn't dig too deep, but their rationale may have been a little different than potentially a, a family that had some, that were caring for maybe elderly parents or something along those lines uh, at the elementary school. I know we have some families there that said, um, you know, my, my mom is now moving in with us and I just don't want to risk having my daughter at school. We would like to send her to virtual. Um, we didn't uh, inventory or survey them on why they were coming or why they were going out. So. Well, when I said from our last meeting, and what you have already listed here, it's a dramatic decrease in the K through six. Mm -hmm. And what we did have some increases at grade 12. Correct. Okay. Yep. And those were, I think, a couple of sophomores, but the rest were senior students that mm -hmm. elected to go out. And let's be realistic. If you're heading into your second semester of your senior year in high school, 
you have virtually met everything but one or two requirements to graduate. And a couple of those kids are, are pretty savvy. I'm certain that they're going to work. And I have no problem with that. I'll be 100% honest with you. If that's what it takes for them uh, to moving forward in their life and they have opportunities, and uh, I'm sure a few of them do. So, mm -hmm. Any further questions on that? Uh, we will keep an eye on that. Uh, and I think as we roll through into potential vaccination, uh, I think you could potentially see this even change more. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll, we'll meet with the principals again. We, we have our administrative council meeting in February, and we'll kind of lay out anybody looking at uh, possibly the end of the third quarter coming back and what our plan would be that late in the school year. Okay? All right. So you are going to let them come back at the end of the quarter if they want to. Yeah, and I think just because in all, the program we have is an outstanding program. It's high quality. It's still not as good as being in a classroom with a teacher and, and, and having you know social interaction with your peers. It's just still not as good. Sounds good. Okay. Um, 5.3. 5.3 COVID-19 vaccination phase 1B for school district employees. Um, this has changed three times in, in the last uh, few days. Um, in, in last week's, the initial plan was that the Ohio Department of Health was going to be assigning us a vaccination partner, and uh, that vaccination partner would coordinate with us, and uh, we would get our vaccine shipments and schedule it in whole nine yards. Uh, and then it was uh, last, I believe, last Thursday, uh, the vaccination partnership was uh, shared to the educational service centers of the state of Ohio. There are 52 uh, ESCs. They were challenged with assisting local school districts in their vaccination partnership. And, uh, but they said if you had a partner already established and you didn't need their help, then just work with your partner. We didn't have, we don't have a vaccine partner per se, um, because what a vaccine partner would be would be a uh, registered vaccination organization such as Promedica, Mercy, Kroger, Pharmacy, uh, whomever. There are, there are, I think, 12 in the county that are permitted to administer the vac vaccine. Today, we, we were told today that the state of Ohio would be sending us information on the allotment. And I've heard conflicting reports that there would be just a small portion of the vaccine that would be allocated for your school district. But I got uh, confirmation today from our local health commissioner. She said it looks like they're going to allocate whatever doses you need for your employees. With that being said, last Thursday I reached out to uh, Doug Bush, the, the president of uh, Defiance Regional Promedica, and asked him if they would be willing to serve as a vaccine partner for us in coordinating, delivering, and administering the vaccine. They already have the protocols in place, uh, the people, um, and he said, of course, we we'd be willing to help and partner with you in doing that, but we do not have any of the logistics worked out because we haven't been given any of that um, from uh, the, the Ohio Department of Health or, or the governor's office. Ideally, this is what I told Doug Bush. I said, we have uh, a teacher work day on Friday the 12th, and we have President's Day Monday the 15th. Boy, if we could get a team of vaccinators uh, on site and administering it to our employees that so desired to have the vaccine, that'd be ideal. I said, that may be pie in the sky, Doug. I don't know if that's even a realm of possibility. So I should know more. I, I haven't checked my email since about 4 o'clock, but I should know more tomorrow specifically how it'll go. Uh, and then, of course, coordinating with the employees that want it. Uh, but I think what it does is it, 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 and I shared this with Tim on the phone earlier today, it gives us a little light at the end of the tunnel. And it helps us, you know, those that are, are, are uh, willing to get the vaccine and see it as a benefit for them. And neither here nor there, if you choose to get it or not. Um, but I, I think that's uh, kind of a recovery and, and moving forward for, uh, uh, for our, you know, our school district and all school districts across the state. And I think the governor's putting his money where his mouth is and he wants kids in school. So, um, I hope, hopefully, go ahead, Mr. Rumber. Is, is there a cost to the individual? That it is a federal uh, asset. The vaccine is so the federal government's covering the cost of the vaccine. One of the conversations we had today is: Does the provider 
or the issuer of the vaccine have the ability to charge an administrative fee? And yes, they do, but that would still be at no expense to the employee because all vaccines are covered under our consortium insurance. They could bill that and it would be covered at 100%, so there would be no cost to the employee. Okay. And uh, you mentioned uh, those employees who wish to have the vaccine. Uh, do we have a number? Yes, I actually, it's about 78% of our 374 employees. And when I say 374 employees, if you are a coach and you coach our eighth grade basketball team, but you're not a school teacher or a bus driver or whatever, you're considered an employee, you're on our payroll. I listed anybody that would be eligible. So um, that's the, the, now the hard part is, you know, I cannot violate or really know who wants to get it or doesn't want to get it. Uh, so it's going to be, um, you know, kind of a delicate balance getting the right people to there. Um, you know, do you use a date of employment list as, uh, as first come, first serve, or is it sign up, first come, first serve? There's a lot of logistics to it to be worked out. I just out. don't want to see any of the vaccine become wasted. No, no. We have ordered a certain number. No. So it, it, that's something that um, they are doing now because exactly what you said had happened. You know, they had ordered so many for so many uh, people. People could, couldn't make it for whatever reason. Some of it had to be uh, disposed of. Now they are taking and working into the next list instead of disposing of the vaccine. They're working further down the list. And I think that uh, um, I think whatever they allocate to us, we'll get it all done as, as soon as possible. And, and uh I think everything comes into play. If it means they say, hey, we can get all of your people that want it done today and we have to close school, then I'm willing to do that so they can go get it done. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, this could be one of these things we're going to find out on a day and we're going to have about a day to turn it around and figure it out, and notify everybody to get signed up and go. Um, and it will be uh, I, I, what I feel good about is that Doug uh, said, Bob, that's how we've had to do every one of these. We're good at this last minute. We don't typically know what our allocation is going to be. We'll work with you. We'll get it done, and we'll help you out. So, And I didn't ask them if they were going to charge the $20 administrative fee, and they may not. I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm not too concerned about I it at this point. They have not been approved as a vaccine provider yet. I think they're still working through that process. So, And this is not the end of for an individual who may be employed through the school district, if they don't get it now, they decide later on they can start. Absolutely. If you said when I sent the interest survey out, uh, then you said no, that doesn't preclude you. And if you said yes, that doesn't mean you have to. Um, again, this is kind of, there'll be a whole bunch of moving parts to this. I'm just, you know, I think people are eager. Uh, they're hearing a lot about it. What's great is, uh, again, uh, from, from a meeting with the governor's office today, it appeared uh, that he shared with the health departments that uh, they're going to send allocation specific amounts to school districts because he wants them in school and uh, he's going to try and deliver on that promise. So a um, couple of cool things coming up. Uh, believe it or not, we have our, for, uh, in, at least in the 15 years I've been here, uh, we're having homecoming and we're having it Saturday. Uh, and it's going to be the homecoming at uh, our basketball game. Uh, we will still put a uh, homecoming court out and introduce them to the parents that are at our basketball game on Saturday night. We will elect a homecoming queen and king at that event uh, Saturday. So kudos for Mr. Jurger and, and uh, his team for thinking outside the box and still making things happen and, and, uh, and having a homecoming. Um, I told him that uh, make his speech short and he said, I'm not even going to be near the microphone. Um, so. Uh, we, we do have a school board meeting on uh, Wednesday, February 10th. And again, I mentioned no school on the uh, 12th and the 15th. We have an in-service day, then President's Day, and then we're rapidly approaching the end of February already. And it seems like we were just talking about the beginning of uh, January. So um, any questions on any of that? Uh, Mr. Rodenberg, you inquired. This is 5-5 uh, five, five school zone on South Jefferson. You had inquired and I had reached out to the city and, and uh, shortly after your first inquiry and then for whatever reason we didn't connect. But I have followed up with uh, the city engineer, uh, Ohio Department of Transportation and the city law director on, on w w what's the rationale, how did it all come about. And it was part of the safe 
Safe to school. school, safe routes to school. safe routes to school. I was going to say safe sidewalks to school, um, and it was part of that. And it was in 2008 when the elementary school was being built. That was when the, they went into the agreement on that. The one of the concerns that the initial thought process of the the city law director was, um, he was concerned that because it was grant money that paid for that that there could potentially be having to return grant money. Uh, but then he did a little more access or did a little more research and because it's on a state highway, the city really doesn't have any jurisdiction over it and it's now a Ohio Department of Transportation um, stop stop sign. So let me let me pull it in. There was a, a litany of uh, conversations that took place through this. Um, the long of the short of it is it's considered a controlled access highway. Um, that means every street uh, with respect to which owners or occupants or abutting lands, uh, you have no legal right of access to or from it, etc. So this is from the, um, um, the law director. And it basically says they cannot say what the speed limit can be during that school zone sign. But what we as the school district have the ability to do is adjust the times at which it operates. Currently, it operates from 7.15 in the morning to 9.15 in the morning. It's two hours. Then again, at 2.15 to 4.15 p.m. Um, the young lady that was our crossing guard there, uh, I had her doing head counts for me, um, and then she abruptly resigned to care for an ill parent, and I haven't been able to connect with her to get me, like, how many kids are crossing there. Um, so... I don't want to say it's it, it's it, we have to do a little more digging on it. Um, the Ohio Department of Transportation gentleman said something to the effect of, uh, it was it, of course it was very what I would call what you would expect to have a transportation guy to mm -hmm. say. Um, here it is. Uh, in my opinion, the crossing and the school zone flashers are installed because the school children are walking to school in that, in that vicinity. Um, eliminating the approved school zone extension and still having kids walk there seems to be counterproductive. That isn't what we were asking him. This is how he responded. Maybe verify whether or not the flashers are operating in conjunction with the times at which children are crossing, uh, which would be more. Operating the flashers beyond those times um, could affect and invite disrespect for the device itself. So what, what the, the city engineer recommended we do is we really see if, when there is a count. I can tell you that uh, I sat there, I went right after we had our first meeting about it, and I went and sat for the elementary uh, crossing. I got there about 8.30, because that's when the employee shows up. And uh, at 9 o'clock, when she left to go back to her duty, there were zero students that crossed. And I think for us to, to move forward with it, we would have to truly justify that there are n n not enough crossers or bike riders or walkers there to, to warrant a, a school zone. Um, and then that would be through the Ohio Department of Transportation. We'd have to do that. The other reason I have, you know, and I brought the concern up is, is the fact that well, it is located so far or distant from the school. We closed access to the school through the back of uh, what street is that? Rosewood. Rosewood. But the, the, lane, water, the lane approaching the elementary off of Carter is, is, is signed 35. As you go from Carter into the elementary itself, it's 35. 35 on Carter Road right there? No, 35 coming into the elementary yeah, on the property on the property <clears throat> so you know and then we have a 20 mile an hour here uh, there out here there is no speed limit it says 25 it says no it says restricted during school hours but it right. doesn't tell you what those are right. that because I've wondered about that sign for and, 15 years and we have no flashing lights for kids crossing and they cross the they cross here at the uh, Roundabout, mm -hmm. and they cross the main roundabout on Jefferson, and it's you know, I, and we don't. Well, to me, that seems to be where we want as a flashing light. Right, right. Uh, but it, and it, I understand it, the reason for it. Sure, place sure. There because the grant money is available to be done. But, uh, I think that, and the grant money was more of a, a, a 
putting sidewalks yeah. from all the way around all the way over to it. That's what the grant really, mm -hmm. and I think it was, yeah, we'll put a school zone sign up there too. But if you, in some of the larger cities or the pumps you come to Western Crossing, if you get that button, that thing starts flashing. Yeah. And you see it. Yeah. You do see and it, and see you it better stop as well. Easier than I would seeing that mm -hmm. 20 mile an hour sign, flashing sign. So if, if that can be replaced, I think that would be a better solution to what we currently have and answer the question of traffic. And it can be utilized by any pedestrian at any time crossing Jefferson. This was submitted on September 24, 2008, and it's. Um, 930 total feet uh, from the beginning of it, first signage to the end of it. So I told uh, I told the city that that we would probably spend a little more time, and I really I think on our part before we did anything, we'd want to see how many kids are crossing it. And if it if it warrants like, you know, if there I, I don't even want to put a number, but a very minimal number, then we can work out if we have to drive by there and uh, pick kids up to make that. Be the case, then we'd be willing to do that. So, um, um, and take ahead. a note about that. It, at least when I've gone out there in warmer weather, it seems to me there are more children using that crossing. I think because they're starting to ride their bicycles and whatnot. So you may want to the the um, compared to in sure, the cold months. Sure. The um, the crossing guard said at the beginning of the school year she would say six to ten. Um, yeah at the beginning of the school year and then it would slowly dwindle and she said she could potentially go a week at a time without having somebody cross and she said you know it might be a mom leaving that neighborhood stops lets their kid out just so they don't have to drive into it and then then the crossing guard lets the helps the kid cross so um it was a lot harder to get information on it than I thought it would be. That's and I, for sure. And, and I agree with Kathy. I think during the warmer times of the year, there are going to be more mm -hmm. kids that are going to utilize that crossing. However, uh, to me, again, I think it is safer for the pedestrian or the bike rider if they have an activated button that they can push that flashes immediately mm -hmm. and lets the driver know that there's someone in the crosswalk. Yeah. Uh, Rather than just that, you know, ding, sometimes ding. you can just blow through that 20 mile an hour sign and not even think about it. Next thing you know, there's a kid walking across and you had just the 20, and you could be going 20 and still have a kid walk. Absolutely across. correct. See, there's nothing that says that they have to stop at that crosswalk and allow those pedestrians to cross. Uh, well, one of the things that will help too, because as she crosses them there, or as the, the aide crosses them on Jefferson, then they sidewalk down Rosewood. Then we also have a, a road that they cross on our property where we have another crossing guard that's there. And so, uh, and she's been with us since we started that at that specific spot. So I may be able to get um, at least an opinion on, on what she sees as a, a volume of people. Thank she, you. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, no problem. I just thought I, you know, I, I'd follow up with it again. So, all right. Let's see. 5.6. Well, my, my, my uh, uh, computer went blank on me, so I have to get it on paper pencil. Uh, your administrative reports, I'm not going to go over them in, in great detail. Did you folks have any questions? Did you have an opportunity to look through them? Yeah. Okay. It's like the year's going along well. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I, you know, it seems like just about everything I've talked to you folks about since the beginning of the school year is uh, COVID related stuff. Uh, we're still having school, and uh, I think it's important that our, you, you hear from our administrators and, and what they have going on there. Uh, they have challenging days with, with all of this as well, and I tried to just remind them that, you know, it's still school, um, still, uh, you know, point out the good things and, and highlight some cool things that are happening in, in and with our school district. I thought so. that part about the TV video thing <laughs> at the high school was interesting. Can I tell you something funny about the TV video? Um, so the weather um, uh, weather person on our Defiance News Network, her name is Summer LaRoe. And Summer LaRoe emailed me this morning uh, at 8 o'clock and said, Mr. Morton, I just want you to know, 
as the superintendent of school, there is a winter weather advisory headed your way. <laughs> and then she put in parentheses, hint, hint, hint. And she said, I would love to do a story of you driving around and checking the roads. And here is my number. My mother will likely answer the phone and you'll wake her up and then she will wake me up. But I'd be happy to talk to you at 5 o'clock tomorrow morning when you're out on the road. So I promise you what? She's going to get a phone call at 5.05 a.m. Because that's, that's about the time I back out of the garage. So John Mays is going to say, who, who are you talking to so early in the morning? So. Um, I thought you were going to say you and John were going to pick her up and she yeah, Well, you know, I, 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 I might just do that. I might just give her, if, but I have a feeling her mom's going to say, you really want me to wake her up? And I'm going to say, absolutely wake her up. So, yeah. all right. So if... Uh, we'll split by in five minutes to pick her up. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! I don't think so. we're supposed to get that much snow. But just a little bit of ice in the morning. I know. Yeah. A little bit of ice in the morning. So. All right. Thank the administrators for giving us all that information. Yeah, and uh, I know that they're eager to get back to the school board meetings and attend, so they're chomping at the bit. So they don't even ask anymore if they have to come. And at least they used to, uh, you know, say, "Hey, are, are you sure you don't need us?" Now they're like, "Bye, have a good meeting." Um, so, all right, Mr. Motes, that's all I have on uh, uh, discussion items. Uh, Six point uh, one, the Fine City School Foundation. Okay. Uh, approve uh, Chris Palmer as a trustee for the Defiance City Schools Foundation for a three-year term. Uh, Donna Polsey Ashenmeyer, Jeff Horvath, and Louis Rivera for the second three-year term beginning 1-1 one, one of 21. I'll move to approve the trustees. Uh, second. I'll second. Michael, all our roll call, please. <clears throat> Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mrs. Oberlin? Yes. Mr. Motes? Yes. Mr. Rodenberger? Yes. Mr. Wall? Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, move on down the consent agenda. Does anybody have anything that needs to be removed from the consent agenda? I do have a question on the ice cream mm -hmm. vendor. Mm -hmm. Is that for the uh, As the weather warms up to brighten the spirits, she wants to. Uh, um, we actually have ice cream coolers in the in the cafeterias, in and it the cafeteria. would so they could be able to purchase it as an extra. Not really, uh, not not a soft serve machine or anything like that. No, no, it's to serve for, uh, during school lunches. They have uh, I call them scooter crunch bars. They don't call them that anymore, but you know, strawberry, um, raspberry, orange, chocolate. Um, I, I told her as long as they had samples for us to decide if it was any good or not, we'd right. be good them. And the reason we have to get board action is because of the federal procurement requirements. Is that right. correct? Because the cafeteria fund that purchases it is all federal money. So mm -hmm. we did go through a, a consortium for the bid process for that, and they used the um, the bid award person uh, company to to do that. So we're good on the procurement side. How many individuals uh, bid on this particular contract? Our contract. You know, how many companies? How many companies? Yes. The go through the bid process. Yes. Um, I don't know off the top and of my they, head. When they when they bid or they, they're bidding for the whole consortium. Is that yes. Right? So like this. Like Hershey was awarded the the bid for the consortium in August. Mm -hmm. Um, we just used them as going through the bid process for us, not that we would hit that bid threshold, but you know, with the new procurement, well, I say new, um, but with the federal procurement coming out, there they have like different designations for what the purchases are. This falls under small purchases, doesn't necessarily need to be bid, but they do recommend that you get price quotes. So in order to meet those requirements and stay on the safe side of that procurement, we go ahead and use the, the company that was awarded the bid. Um, otherwise, we have to show rationale of why we didn't choose that or go through the bid process ourselves. So, is it, would a local vendor have had an opportunity to bid? If they're part of the consortium. Um, I know, like, for example, ARPS is, mm -hmm. is local, and they are not part of the consortium that we use for the bidding. But what we're able to do there is we're able to go through the bid process ourselves or the, the small purchase process because they're not in the full bid. And we're able to use the quotes that the consortium gathers combined with ARPS. And then we use a scoring system. Mm -hmm. It's the superintendent, myself, and the cafeteria supervisor. We use a scoring system once we receive all those. And then we award to the, the, um, the winning 
and your and one of the one of the scoring categories is if you're a local vendor in the community, you're allowed to use that as part of your rationale for scoring them right. the way you do. And Customer of course, with service. a local vendor, that's that's what right. we do. We score them higher right. because you know they're. There well, it falls under customer service, yeah. especially with milk yeah. being a product that sure. has an expiration date. So, but um, but yeah, we actually use um, we use Meta for the buses, um, HPS for a lot of the cafeteria stuff, and then recently we've actually are now part of um, Ohio School Council. Correct. So we can use that pool of people as well. So this is, is this significant difference in cost. But I would say there's probably between anywhere between six and eight people, companies that would bid for a certain mm -hmm. type. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking more because I haven't really looked at ice cream specifically because it's kind of a specialty or novelty. Right. But looking at like the bread and um, like Gordon Food Service when you're looking for commodities, there's usually between like said like four and seven companies that actually will do the full bid for the consortium, and then it's awarded to one. Interestingly enough, she's talking about commodities. You used to get a commodity semi that was arrived that had that on it. Now your government commodities come through vendors, yeah. and it's not through a semi that shows up from the from the government with your peanut butter and cheese and your turkey and everything else on it. So, because I I was saying, how can we do this croissant and ham and cheese sandwich as a uh, free and reduced lunch? They said because the the Everybody is essentially awarded the ability to offer that, so it's better for the kids. They get better food, that's for sure. Well, yeah, I'm yeah. disappointed they're not getting prunes like that. <laughs> <laughs> I still miss a square pizza. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Actually, rectangular. Yeah. 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 And and it was Tony's. Do you it anymore? Oh yeah, you could still get it, but it's it used to be like the highlight every week. Now you get it like once a month, well, and the kids are like, uh, "What about that triangle stuff that is, you know, got big pepperonis on it?" I mean, they come with sheets. Yeah. Oh yeah. Eight to all. Oh, I grew up on that. Yeah. We'll talk after. I want to know where it's available. GFS actually. Yeah, you can go to Gordon Foods to get it there. Oh the whole my thing. god. Yeah, I go to the one in Toledo. It's all yours, Chris. So, any other discussion on the cost? Does anybody need any items removed from the consent agenda? I'll move to approve if there are uh, no. Yep, Chris, with a, with, do I have a second to approve the consent agenda? I'll second. Michael? Uh, roll call then. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mrs. Oberlin? Yeah. Mr. Wall? Yes. Mr. Rodenberger? Yes. Mr. Motes? Yes. Moving on down, do we have any old business for the board tonight? Uh, I just wanted to, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, ask Cheryl if, uh, if, if you can give me an update where we are with the uh, booster organizations and groups that we went over that last year. Are we everybody on the same page as far as um, handling those? Or? When we did it last year, I believe, and you and I talked about this the mm -hmm. other day. Yeah, we did. Um, last week. That there are still the two booster groups that have been approved by the board. There are ones that have been approved in the past, and I'm still trying to make sure I get all their documentation to bring them back to be approved by the board. Um, the problem being is that, one, they're not extremely active right now, except for the bigger ones, and two, their um, leadership usually changes. Yeah. So we're still working on getting all the, the paperwork that we need to bring it to the board to get them an approved vendor. Or approved booster, even though they probably were when they originally incorporated. Um, I just wanted to kind of update that to make sure. Yeah, now when, we're, when we talk about booster groups, the difference between a booster group and maybe a parent group, I, I think there, there is a distinction, correct? Or correct. A booster group <coughs> is registered with the Attorney General's office. Mm -hmm. They're registered as a booster group for a school district. If you go out to the Attorney General's office, you can put in their name and pull up the organization mm -hmm. details. Um, the parent groups sometimes can be subsidiaries of that booster group, but I think the main thing that, that the question is, like, whose tax ID are they under? Because you can be a nonprofit and not be tax exempt if you don't apply for a tax exempt certification. So, like, say, for example, let's use athletic boosters because I know they have their tax exempt. <laughs> <laughs> um, that they have the parent groups under them, the parents' groups could fall under their tax exempt status. Otherwise, um, parent groups, if they are getting together, they need to be recognized by the school district as a support group or a booster group for the organization. 
In order to do that, they need to just apply for an EIN. So it, it, each year, you know, you have kids enter from, say, the elementary school to come into the middle school mm -hmm. and, and participate in athletic programs and, and, and music and things like that. And you might have a parent that will say, you know, we want to provide a meal for the kids on the way home from the game. Can everybody toss in $10? I do not consider that to be a booster group. I would agree 100% with that. That is you doing something on your own. You're not out soliciting right. for funds. Right. And yeah. Once you solicit for mm -hmm. funds, then you're doing then it. Then you become the an issue. Yes. It becomes a, right. So say if that if you guys did that for the first year, and then the next person that comes in and says, hey, you know, now it costs 20 bucks a person. That's getting a little steep. So I have a kid in three sports. Mm -hmm. um, how about we get you know Gary's business to sponsor us? Mm -hmm. Then you're becoming a booster, booster organization. Booster. Yes. You can't yeah. solicit for funds. If, because it would, you, it, as Chris Oberlin, if she came to you and said, I want to buy the whole basketball team pizza, uh, fine. Yeah, you're, 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 you're just you're supporting them, but you're not a booster. Uh, Big we're difference. not actively soliciting funds from that individual or right. Correct. business. Correct. Or if you like go to the stands and say, hey, the on the way home, the kids want to eat. Everybody want to throw in five bucks. If you really got to stay within the group of right. parents mm -hmm. or um, it, once you go outside and ask for support from the general public. Yeah. And, and for me, I think that's the key. Once you solicit donations from outside organizations or maybe even through a raffle or... Right, formally or informally. Thing. Yes. Then, then you're into the... Business. You're crossing... You're you're cross, right. Yeah, the, the lines become very blurred yeah. about how you're established, so... Thank and I, th I think you bring them all together. I think you get a little bit of everything you just said between all of them. Mm -hmm. you know, so We're trying to come up with a process where you know we, we get them at the beginning of the year, we hand out the information that they need, and then you know and incorporate a process to where there is a change of hands because it's going to change every year for some mm -hmm. of those organizations because their kids go up and right. you know, or they graduate, they move. You know, it's, um, I've paid my time. Yeah, just so they're aware, because a lot of the booster groups that I talk to have no idea that they're doing something that they shouldn't be doing. They're just trying to do the best for kids. Right. Um, but we just want to make sure, because when you when you go out and do stuff like that, like say in your example, it goes from the 10 bucks a piece to, hey, let's sell some raffle tickets so we can have a pizza party or something. Um, you know, That comes back on you personally, mm -hmm. as well as the school, because you're soliciting for public funds. Um, and and, and that, that, that's my major concern is... We, not that anything has ever happened within the five state school district, but I know outside the school district and some of the local organizations, there have been some misappropriation of Correct. funds that have been donated to the organization. And the last thing our, we as a school district want to do is, is, is have something of that nature take place here. Right. And so, whatever you do, do not collect that money. Like say, hey, everybody put in 50 bucks at the beginning of the year and put it in a bank account and then use that bank account to pay for the food. Don't do that. Yeah, then, then you're a booster organization then once you organizing. do that. Yeah. Get 10 bucks every time. Yeah, yeah exactly. Do Don't not a open bank a bank account. account. That is correct. I, I think it's important you know, for parents or groups to come together. And, 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 and you know, 100% of Oh yeah, 100% good intentions. That, but I don't want to see that 100%. All it takes is one time for something to happen. Right. That's all it takes. Right. Like I said, it's never an issue until somebody makes it an issue. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any more old business? Um, sorry, Mr. Moat. Yes. Uh, I don't know. Mr. Uh, Mort would like to take the lead on this on our recent. Uh, Foundation meeting? Uh, yeah, I, I, I can start and we can kind of tag team that. Uh, we did have uh, our uh, foundation meeting that would have been last Wednesday evening and uh, we did it remotely at 7 p.m. and uh, we had uh, great attendance. We had some te technical difficulties, but we did have it. Uh, Selena uh, Frederick presided over the meeting as the vice president. Mr. Sondergaard was not able to attend. Um, and. Uh, the highlights for me is uh, one. The meeting was ran exceptionally well. I thought that that Selena, you know, coming in, uh, being pressed to duty, ran an excellent meeting. But um, the new brochure. Um, have you all been made aware of the new brochure? Have you all gotten it in the mail? If you haven't, uh, you will be getting it, uh, as school board members. Uh, it was actually created by a marketing class, Mr. Klein's class, in DECA. And they used some pictures and worked with the public, uh, the publicity committee of the foundation. Um, and uh, 
the fall campaign, the, the mailing campaign uh, has gone on and gone out and uh, the actual investments, I don't have the dollar amount off, off the top of my head, but the investments are doing very well. They had a, a good campaign. Uh, they approved awarding many grants uh, again this year, uh, scholarships. Uh, many grants were around $19,000 scholarships in the form of about $8,000, if I'm um, not mistaken. Uh, and then, of course, you approved the people that they would like to serve on their um, on their board. So, anything else, Mr. Rodemer? I understand that uh, if you'd like to, uh, they have started a Facebook page. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I have it on my phone here. I can't figure out how to get it on the other <laughs> device. But uh, it's, uh, the address is www.facebook.com backslash Defined City School Foundation. And that, there was a, a picture, and you can look at the brochure itself right there. Uh, and I think uh, you know, all, all the people involved in the foundation, I, I think, are outstanding people. But it's good that we have uh, some very talented young individuals that are bringing technology uh, to the organization, or to the foundation. And, uh, any way that they can get the word out there, they're trying to do that, and they're doing a very good job at it. One of the key components to that is what can you do via that page? You can donate to the Defined City Schools yes. Foundation. And that, that was one of the rationales of moving forward. I think it links to the uh, Area Foundation PayPal account. And again, you're talking about a, a support organization with a uh, EIN and uh, right. through the Ohio mm -hmm. Attorney General's Doctors office and yeah. Secretary of State's yeah. office and you know you have to make sure all of that's uh, <clears throat> taken care of but um, because they have to submit all of that when they request that you are donating through them uh, and, so and, and the money's donated to the foundation benefit the students benefit the students it's not going to pay a teacher salary it's not going to buy a bus it's 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 benefiting the students directly and uh, through, through scholarships or, 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 or mini grant programs and things of that nature. So it's very, very worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Appreciate you serving on that board. Thank you. I, I enjoy it. That's, <clears throat> that's all I have for us. I'm sorry. All right. New business. Does anybody have any new business before tonight? Seeing none, we'll move into executive session um, for matters. Is it number five, matters? You've got Actually, it's number one uh, to consider the appointment, employment, dismissal, promotion, uh, uh, demotion, compensation of a public employee. I'll make a motion for executive session for those purposes, Bob mentioned. Second. 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 Yes. Mr. Modes? Yes. Mrs. Oberlin? Yes. Mr. Odenberger? Yes. Mr. Wall? Yes. Thank you. I have to walk off of that. Yeah, I'll shut it off. Um, 551 time. Yeah, 551. Tim, I don't anticipate any, any action.